desperate for help you know what it's like to be tired and only a shell of yourself but you start to believe you don't have what it takes because it's all you can do just to move much less finish the race Good morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to River of Life. uh, It's good to see you this morning. Um, The Lord has blessed our weekend and uh, gave us some rain that we desperately needed. And uh, we had a rummage giveaway here yesterday that was just a a huge success. Uh, The Lord blessed that. uh, Casey, I know I'm putting you on the spot again, but can you join me here just really quick, really quick? Real quick, real quick. Um, we, we had hundreds of people come through the church here yesterday, and we blessed uh, many families, and it was just really cool how um, the Lord directed certain items into certain families, and we really think God just had his hand upon the whole thing. And uh, I know Casey, who really coordinated this whole thing, put it together, and I know that her heart has been to thank many of you for being a part of this, so I'm just going to let her do that. Yes, well, thank you for all of your help, too. It was, it was a true partnership with the church, um, bringing life to this idea that the Lord gave me. So it was a really exciting day yesterday. Um, thank you for your prayers. Thank you to everyone who donated. Thank you to everyone who came and helped yesterday. Um, and thank you for your support online and just getting the word out and sharing it with everyone. It was um, really exciting to see all the needs that were being met yesterday. So, all right. so Thank you so much, Casey. Well, we, uh, we encourage you to uh, stay connected um, with your cell phone into the bulletin. If you've never signed up for Text in Church, make sure that you do that. Uh, it tells you how to do that um, in the top of the bulletin. Um, make sure that you utilize the cards that are in the chairs right in front of you, the connect cards, the prayer and uh, praise report cards, and uh, your, your response cards. And you can just take those to the next step table, which is a table right in the back of the sanctuary after the, the service, and drop it off. And so we want you to connect with us. I'm going to invite you to stand this morning, and we're going to move into a time of worship. And I'm going to turn it over to Lucas and the worship team. As uh, this is the day the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I think there's a kind of a cause and effect relationship there. 
that if I choose to rejoice in this day that God has made, you know, God has never made today before. It's a brand new creation. Today, it's never happened before. And uh, so if I choose to rejoice today, if I make the choice to rejoice, the, the effect will be gladness. And we always have that opportunity to choose rejoicing. And so we're going to sing together. Sing for joy. And uh, we pray, Father, your blessing on us as we serve you now. And as we sing to you in the name of Jesus, amen. Father, we thank you, Lord, that with joy-filled hearts, we can worship and serve you. Amen.
Jesus, thank you, God, for your spirit here in our lives today. We bless you, Lord. Our prayer, God, is that we do not desire. Jesus, you said that without you, we can do nothing. We acknowledge that. We confess that today, that unless we're connected to you, the source of life, we'll produce no life. God, we want to produce fruit that lasts today. We ask, God, for the move of your spirit we trust for the move of your spirit, God, that, that in our midst, as this next song says, even in ways we're unaware, God, you are in us, you are working through us, you're making a way, God, through the wilderness, you're making a way through the river, God, through the deep waters, through the dry areas, Father, you provide the way, we trust you for that, Father, in Jesus' name.
I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. said the father continues to work and i continue to work the work of jesus today in hebrews says that he ever lives to make intercession for us for you that he stands before the father he represents you before the father um, he, he speaks up on your behalf when the accuser speaks against you the son of god speaks for you he's your intercessor he stands between he's your representative Thank you, Jesus. We confess these truths that even in our lives, in ways we don't see and understand, God, stir us up, stir us up to have faith, to believe you are at work in the most difficult circumstances of life faced in this room today. You are at work. You're in the midst of those. Lord, in the, you're in the midst of them. And God, sometimes in we, we think of Israel in the wilderness and there was a cloud and there was the fire and it was you. God, if they didn't see that, if they didn't recognize that the fire may have been frightening and the cloud may have been confusing, but God, you were there working and standing on their behalf. And you're in that same place for us today. Stir us up in faith, God, to believe that in Jesus' name. Amen. keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you are you are way maker miracle worker promise keeper light in the darkness my god that is who you Church, before we uh, have a seat this morning, I just want us to uh, corporately go to the Lord in prayer. Um, Judy uh, Ballweber that uh, you prayed for last week, um, it sounds like she'll be discharged in a day or two. So we want to continue to be praying for her. Please continue to be praying for uh, Gabe Trottier. You know, as we're singing, um, Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, there's situations of life where we can say it looks like things are hopeless, but when you remember who Jesus is and his power and his authority, he's the way maker, he's the miracle worker, and so he can still intervene. And so he can still intervene in your life, he can still intervene in your families, he can still intervene in your situations. And uh, so let's just take a moment to, uh, to go before the Lord to lay our needs before him and if if everything is good in your life then i encourage you to be praying the prayer come holy spirit on this pentecost sunday god wants to do some incredible things in your life so just invite him to come so let's pray lord we thank you so much for your faithfulness in our lives and god we just thank you for uh 
taking care of Judy and bringing her through some of the, the surgery stuff already. And, and Lord, we just pray, God, that you would heal her up and that you would restore her and help her and be with her in this moment. And Lord, we pray for Gabe. We're asking God for a miracle. We're asking, Lord, that nerves come back to life. We're praying, Lord, that he would walk in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we call out to you as the way maker, the miracle worker. Lord, we're asking for a, a, a demonstration of your power. And Holy Spirit, you know each person here today. You're the one who is intimately acquainted with all of our ways. And we invite you to come, Holy Spirit, to minister to each one of us today and, and to just take us into those intimate places in Christ. Lord, that we would experience your, your conviction because you love us. That we would experience your empowerment, your strength, your, your healing, your deliverance. Holy Spirit, come. We need you. Come this morning and just meet with your people. We need you so much. Thank you. And Lord, we just pray for this service, Lord, that you would have your way, Holy Spirit. Have your way. Speak to your people, we pray. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I'll let you have a seat this morning. Thank you, worship team. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. We are dismissing our kids for Kids Church. Monica is in the back, so kids, you can go ahead and head back to Kids Church. Why don't you turn to someone next to you, just smile really big and say, you are lucky to be sitting next to me today. Those of you that are watching online, we welcome you. Thanks for joining us today as well. Just a couple of things uh, before I get into the message today. I want to give just a quick update. One of the things, uh, just so you are aware, we are going to uh, kind of, for, for our offerings uh, from this point on, where we just got some boxes that are in the back, uh, and we have used those in the past, uh, but we're not going to pass the offering basket uh, today. So if you've got your, your uh, tithe offering, your financial gift, I uh, just encourage you to drop that in the, uh, the box in the back as you leave, or maybe when you come in uh, in the morning. Uh, one of the things we just found is just the, the time that it takes to do all that. And some of you, you're so good at giving uh, and faithful with your giving. So I appreciate that. Again, the boxes are available in the back. Uh, ushers will be uh, bringing up the uh, fellowship registers. Uh, you can just kind of, there's some things in the bulletin. If you want more information about, uh, you just check the fellowship register and the appropriate column there. We'll make sure that we get uh, someone in contact with you. So ushers, you can go bring the fellowship registers and just pass those out if they have not already begun yet. And uh, uh, just another quick update. Um, with, uh, with last Sunday. Last Sunday, we had Peter and Kayla Olson with us in Missions Sunday, and uh, I shared a little bit in our family meeting uh, that uh, because of your generosity uh, and your, your giving and the love offering for Peter and Kayla Olson, uh, we were able to bless them with almost $900 in a love offering uh, for their, their cash budget. Uh, we were also able to pick them up as our monthly missionary, uh, ministry partners, so we are supporting uh, Peter and Kayla Olson on a monthly basis starting June 1st. In addition to our missions giving, again, when you designate uh, missions or kingdom builders online or, or here, uh, the other thing that we are doing with your finances is we have been able to help three of our students participate in uh, mission trips. Kirsten, my daughter, actually has uh, been in the Dominican Republic all week. She actually is on her way back today, so we're able to help her. Caleb Woodrow is going to be going on a mission trip to Chicago. Larissa Klitsky is going to be going on a mission trip to Chicago. We're able to help them uh, uh, to, to take that mission trip. We also have the uh, opportunity to uh, increase some of our monthly mission support uh, for some of our current ministry partners. And one of the others that I'm excited about is there are two plants, uh, two church plants that are taking place in the state of North Dakota. Uh, one of them is in Minot, Full Life Assembly, and uh, an African church there, and another one in West Fargo, uh, church plant there. And because of your missions giving, the board just recently made the decision uh, that we are uh, going to invest in those church plants, so we were able to give $2,500 to each one of those church plants as well. 
uh, to get things up and running. So thank you for your giving. Uh, thank you for your faithfulness in your giving. And uh, we want to just continue to be about the priorities, uh, the things that are the, the priority to God. Uh, that becomes our priorities as well. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, several other things that are in your bulletin, just take a look through that. Uh, again, Fellowship Register, if there's some specific details or information that you'd like about one particular area, uh, just go ahead and check that. Well, today, if you got your Bibles, uh, we are going to dive right in today. Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4 is where we're going to be uh, kind of the main passage. Today I'm going to be talking about, <clears throat> the title of my message is The Pentecostal Edge. The Pentecostal Edge. How the Holy Spirit changes everything. Some of you are maybe fans or, or enjoy history. There is an interesting historical event that actually we are living right now. In 2021, because it was 90 years ago this year, so in 1931, there was an individual by the name of Blanche Britton. Go ahead and go to the next slide if you would, Cody. Blanche Britton and another female pastor named Mildred Westerland held a church service in Devil's Lake, North Dakota, in a town meeting downtown Devil's Lake that seated 400 people, history tells us. And soon afterward, that church meeting, the people that were touched and experienced the power of God, gathered together and formed a church that, that continued on in the, in the Devil's Lake community. Over the last 90 years, that, that Lake Gospel Tabernacle, which was the name of it, Lake Gospel Tabernacle changed names a couple of times, changed locations a couple of times. But right now, we are sitting and participating in what started 90 years ago, and what started as Lake Gospel Tabernacle is now River of Life Assembly of God. Started 90 years ago, again, by Blanche Britton and Mildred Westerland. You and I right now are part of a church and experiencing an opportunity to come together as a church and to reach our community because of the faithfulness, the obedience, the courage, and the boldness of a woman named Blanche Britton and Mildred Westerland. Because of their obedience, because of their faithfulness, because of their boldness to go into a community that had not experienced Pentecost before, I would dare say that it's safe to assume that thousands of lives have been changed. Thousands of individuals have had the opportunity to experience the saving power of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Now, I need to backtrack a little bit. Today is Pentecost Sunday. Some of you have been in AG churches or Pentecostal churches your entire life. Some are fairly new to this Pentecost thing. So I want to just explain a little bit what this, this whole idea of Pentecost means. Pentecost Sunday is actually the Sunday uh, on church calendar that we commemorate and we celebrate the, the receiving of the Holy Spirit by the early church in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, where the Holy Spirit came down, uh, Acts chapter 2, they were all in one accord. Uh, the, the disciples, the 120 in the upper room, they prayed, and the Holy Spirit manifested again uh, in cloven tongues of fire. They spoke in different languages. All of that happened. That was on the day of Pentecost, which we now uh, refer to as the day of Pentecost. This whole idea of the gift of the Holy Spirit the gift of the Holy Spirit was prophesied by the, the Old Testament prophet Joel in, in Joel chapter 2. It was prophesied by John the Baptist in the New Testament saying that I baptize you in water, but there is one coming that will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a, 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 an additional experience than just salvation, but it was prophesied by Joel and John the Baptist. Jesus in his ministry actually confirmed the prophecy in John chapter 14, and actually told his disciples when Jesus was crucified, resurrected, and before he ascended to heaven, he told his disciples specifically to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise, the promise being that gift of the Holy Spirit. He didn't just say wait, he actually said, don't leave Jerusalem until you experience it. This is in Acts chapter 1, verse 4. Obviously a significant a significant gift. And Jesus said to his disciples, don't leave because you cannot do what I've called you to do unless and until you have received this gift. 
From that time, again, talked about already, the Holy Spirit came as the 120 were waiting there. And now that movement is referred to as a Pentecostal movement. One of the best definitions that I've come across for what it means to be a Pentecostal believer, a Pentecostal Christian, is actually from uh, Tom Trask. He's a former general superintendent of the Assemblies of God. I wrote a book a number of years ago called Back to the Altar. And this was the description that he gave of Pentecostal Christians or Pentecostal believers. Pentecostal believers are those believers in Jesus Christ and his gospel who identify, identify themselves in belief, in experience, in practice, and priority with the original church born on the day of Pentecost and described in the New Testament. So Pentecostal churches, Pentecostal believers, are those individuals that in each one of those areas, again, what the early church in the book of Acts believed, we align ourselves with those beliefs. What the early church experienced, we align ourselves with those experiences. What the early church practiced, we align ourselves with those practices. And what the early church prioritized, we align ourselves with those priorities. So our heritage, our heritage as Pentecostal believers and our mandate as Pentecostal believers is to really go places where other people are not going, to do things that other people are not doing, to say things that other people are not saying, to reach people that other people are not reaching. Now, I want to make sure that we understand is that as Pentecostal believers and as a Pentecostal church, it does not make us better than any other church. It does not make us more spiritual than any other church. It does not make us any closer to God than any other church. It does make us different than several other churches. There are great churches in our community. There are great churches that are doing great things for the kingdom of God. And we partner together, and and our goal is to see as many people as we possibly can come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's our goal. But one of the things that sets us apart from a lot of churches, even in our own community, is is this whole idea of of Pentecost and what we believe and what we practice specifically in regards to the Holy Spirit. Now, again, there's a number of churches that they they don't disregard, they don't deny that the Holy Spirit uh, is is real, but there are some that that would would say that the Holy Spirit, some of the things that, that happened in the book of Acts, that was things that happened in the book of Acts but those things don't happen today. The reason for those things was just to get the church started. There was a fresh power that was needed, and and some, we would refer to them as cessationalists. They would say that those things in, in the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, they were true, it's historical, it's recorded uh, in the book of Acts and in in the New Testament, but those gifts now have ceased and, and, and are no longer in operation today. We, as Pentecostals, do not take that stand. We believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of the Holy Spirit, is just as real and just as important today, if not more so, than it was in the book of Acts. And it makes us different. One of the things that we're doing is, on Wednesday nights, we're doing a, a group study called Living in the Spirit and kind of drilling down a little bit more specifically on, on some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how these gifts are to be used, and and how they're supposed to operate within the congregation and within the assembly, and and the difference that the Holy Spirit can make even just in our own individual spiritual journey and our spiritual walk. But today, again, understanding that that this whole idea of Pentecost is something that that I'm afraid over the years and, and maybe over time has been kind of marginalized, maybe kind of pushed to the side a little bit because the reality is is that Pentecostals are unpredictable. And when we have a a Pentecostal church service, you're never really sure what's going to happen because we're not the ones that determine the agenda. The Holy Spirit is the one that determines the agenda. And so there's there's some that would say, you know what, but, but there's... There's, there's just a lot of unpredictability, and some have been in those Pentecostal services or encountered Pentecostals, and they have experienced the, what I would refer to as, as the misuse or abuse of some of these gifts of the Spirit and some of these manifestations of the Spirit, and as a result, 
they, they've been a little bit freaked out and said, you know what, that's just a little bit too weird, that's a little bit too wacky, so we're going to go over here and not do anything with the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that we need to understand is that when there's the misuse and abuse of the power of God, and specifically the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the response to that, or the healthy response to that, is not going the other direction and saying, we want nothing to do with that. The healthy response to that is come back to Scripture and find out what's the biblical use of that. Just because people have misused it and abused it doesn't mean it's not real. Just because there's been people that have taken it to the extremes doesn't mean that it's something that we should never pursue and never talk about and never experience for ourselves. And again, the history of the Pentecostal uh, church, and some of you, whether you were raised in Pentecost or maybe uh, uh, saw Pentecostal churches, Pentecostals uh, had kind of a reputation in some communities of, of being the, uh, uh, the chandelier swingers. They were the ones that uh, jumped over the pews during church service. Uh, they, they were the ones that just did all kinds of weird and wacky things. Okay, some of you, just out of curiosity, how many of you were raised in Pentecost? Okay, you were raised in Assembly of God Church. You were very familiar with that. Okay, how many of you were maybe attended a mainline church uh, or, or no church at all? And, and you just didn't see a lot of that. Even today, we have people that come into our services and they experience some things here that they, that they didn't experience in, in some other church. And if they don't understand it, if they don't understand what the Bible has to say about that, the reality is, is that some of it can be a little bit odd. Some of it can be a little bit uh, foreign. But one of the things that we want to do is make sure that we understand, again, coming back, that's why we're doing this uh, small group on Wednesdays, is an understanding of all those things so we don't have to look at them as weird. They're actually biblical. Robert Morris, in his book, The God I Never Knew, he makes an interesting comparison. He just talks about that some people think that once we we experience the Holy Spirit or people that have had this personal experience with the Holy Spirit, they just get weird. And Robert Morris says, we need to understand the Holy Spirit doesn't make people weird. Some of those people, they're just weird. (laughs) It It wasn't the Holy Spirit that made them weird. Okay, that's just, that's just who they are. But when the Holy Spirit comes on people, again, manifests in different ways, but, but we kind of tend to, to kind of shy away from that. And I'm here to tell you, church, the Holy Spirit isn't weird. You may have experienced some people or some situations where, where things were unfamiliar or things were not normally what you've seen or experienced in the past, but the Holy Spirit is not weird. And that's one of the things that is my concern right now is that, that in light of, of maybe the, the excess, the abuse, the misuse, some that would even call themselves Pentecostal believers really haven't pursued those gifts of the Spirit, haven't fully experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit because they don't, they don't want to be one of those weird people. They don't want to be one of those weird churches. It was a number of years ago that I remember in our church, I was praying, actually walking in the foyer, and there was, and we got a great relationship with, with several of the churches in town. There's one of the churches in town that uh, w- was really starting to increase their attendance. Actually, some people from our church started uh, attending that church, and I remember walking in the foyer and just praying, saying, God, what are we, what are we doing wrong? What, what is that church doing that, that we should be doing so people stay here, so that people uh, start coming here? And I remember the guy laid on my heart uh, almost a little bit of a rebuke. He said, you know what? That church is doing what I've called them to do. I've called you to be a Pentecostal church. So do what I've called you to do. And again, it doesn't make us better. It doesn't make us more spiritual. But it does make us different. It kind of sets us apart. It puts us what I would refer to kind of on the edge. The edge. Now, this whole idea of the edge, you've heard that phrase before, people that live on the edge, those people that kind of thrive on on risk. The the edge, actually, the definition is is to have an edge on someone or something. It's to, to have an advantage or to be in a more favorable position than someone or something else. And so, again, the title of my message is The Pentecostal edge. And I'm not saying this in any way to to promote ourselves or make ourselves look more spiritual or better, but I believe this, is that people and individuals and churches 
that embrace what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit, that pursue the power and gifts of the Holy Spirit, they have an advantage. They are able to do things that others are not. They are able to experience things that others do not. They, they go places that others do not. They say things that others do not. There's, there's a different level of spiritual experience. And again, this doesn't make us better. It doesn't make us more spiritual. It does make us different. The edge, again, that, that the place where new territory is taken, where crazy ideas become reality and where progress replaces maintenance. In any area of our society, the people that are really making progress, whether it's in science or medicine or, or technology or anything else, those people are ones that are, that are living on the edge. They're, they're pushing the envelope. They're trying new things. They're doing things that nobody else is doing. And that's what God has called Pentecostals to do, is to live on the edge. The edge is that place where comfort and safety are, are, are pushed to the side and the unknown is pursued. Where, where the risky is actually embraced. When Blanche Britton came to Devil's Lake 90 years ago, my guess would be there was some certain trepidation and uncertainty about what would happen when they tried to do a church service in, in Devil's Lake where, where nothing like that had happened before. There was probably some, some risk involved. And some of you know the stories, even in my hometown of Crosby, Crosby, North Dakota, the, 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 I remember my parents telling the story of, of a tent meeting, one of these revival Pentecostal church services that took place in Crosby, North Dakota, and there were some phenomenal things that were happened there. But at one point during those tent men, meetings, vandals were so opposed to what was happening that they burned down the tent. So there was risk that was involved. And there's, there's, even to this day, there's, there's some that would say, you know what, that, that whole thing of the, the Holy Spirit is just a little bit too risky. The edge, the edge is that place of exhilaration, anticipation, fear, and uncertainty all mixed together. Just out of curiosity, how many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? Anybody to the Grand Canyon? Anybody been to the glass bridge in the Grand Canyon? I was going to show a picture of it, but the glass bridge, actually Mark and I went there a number of years ago, the glass bridge actually goes, I don't know, several hundred feet out, and it's, it's just glass on the floor. And so you go down this bridge, and you are like in the Grand Canyon now, okay? And you are looking at this glass bridge straight down, and there's something that is a little bit unnerving about that. There are individuals that actually walk on that glass. I mean, it's obviously all very reinforced, but there are individuals that go out there and they, they take that first step and they look down and they grab the sides of the bridge and walk very carefully, even though there's been hundreds, if not thousands of people that have done it. But there's something about being on the edge. And, you know, one of the things that safety-wise, we tell our kids, don't get close to the edge. Don't get too close to the edge. I'm not talking just physical safety. Obviously, we need to take care of our kids and protect our children. But unfortunately, we're, we're believing that for ourselves, and we're, we're telling the next generation, too, when it comes to spiritual things, don't get too close to the edge. And I don't believe that that's what Scripture wants of us. Somebody said this, the edge, the edge is the furthest point from the middle of the road. The furthest point from the middle of the road. Cody, you want to put that up if you would? And that's where God has called us. God has called us to live on the edge. The furthest point from the middle of the road. The middle of the road being that place that the large crowds gather. That place where it's easy, where it's comfortable, where it's secure, where it's safe. But God has not called us to the middle of the road. Living on the edge, for many people, seems extreme. Say, so, you know what, I'm just, I'm just not a, a living on the edge kind of person. There's some people that got that personality, and I want to just assure you today that living on the edge, as far as spiritually, really has nothing to do with your personality. Living on the edge is embracing God's fullness for you, for your life, for your family's life. And unfortunately, what happens is is people that have lived on the edge, and again, 
pushed, pushed the boundaries and expanded in particular areas, even in the area of missions. Early missionaries that, that traveled to other countries, Pentecostal missionaries, again, those that experienced the power of the Holy Spirit, called by God to go to other countries to tell people about Jesus. Several stories are told of those missionaries that, that when they would pack their belongings before they would head overseas, they would pack their belongings in a casket. That was their suitcase. They would pack their belongings in a, in a, in a casket, and the casket would be shipped over there because these individuals had no intent of returning back home before they died. They were fully anticipating that the country that they were called to, that they were going to, they were going to die in that country. And some of us would say, well, that's, that's rather extreme, isn't it? You know, people now, and again, we don't have time to go into all the details of, that, of this, but, but just some of the names of some of the early missionaries. Lillian Trasher was one of those missionaries that lived on the edge, and she went to the country of Egypt, and she started one of the first orphanages in Egypt. And, and from that, hundreds and thousands of children were able to be fed and cared for and nurtured and trained and, and raised up in the ways of God. Mark Buntain, another individual that was empowered by the Holy Spirit that said, you know what, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live on the edge. I'm going to go places that nobody else is going. And Mark Buntain went to India and started schools and feeding programs in India. Mark Buntain uh, was, was friends, at least knew Mother Teresa and again, the impact that they had was phenomenal. An individual by the name of J.W. Tucker, a missionary that was called to the Congo, that went there and was ultimately killed in Congo because of what he was doing. Another missionary named Victor Plymeyer went to the, uh, the innermost parts of Tibet where nobody else had gone before. Jim Elliott, many of you are familiar with the story of Jim Elliott and several of his team members killed, uh, he and his team members were killed attempting to evangelize the, the Horani people in, in Ecuador. And the stories after stories after stories of what we refer to now as these heroes of the faith, the people that did amazing things for God, many of them giving their lives for the kingdom of God. And we look at them and say, man, they're heroes. Look at their bravery. Look at their courage. That books are written about these individuals looking through their diaries and, and saying, man, God was doing some amazing things in them and through them. But my observation has been that, that men and women young adults, teenagers of God who, who lived on the edge in the past are honored as spiritual giants and we revere them and we study them and, 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 and we celebrate them. But individuals, men, women, young adults, teenagers who live on the edge today are ridiculed as spiritual fanatics. And unfortunately, that's happened even within the church. There's people that are taking those steps and doing things that are bold and courageous. Even in the church, they say, eh, why don't you come back over here to the middle of the road? It's a little bit, a little bit too risky over there. Tolerance, even in our culture right now, tolerance disguised as love has eroded absolute truth. In the last year, we have seen a bold increase in wickedness and evil behavior. Would we all agree with that? A bold increase. You know what? People are no longer sinning in secret. It is mainstream. And not only is it mainstream broadcast all over the media and all over shows and music right now, videos, it's not only broadcast, it's not only letting people know how blatant they are in their sin, it is now blatant sin that is also demanding that you and I affirm and accept the sin. It's not just doing it. It's just not letting you know. It's no, not only am I going to do this, you also must accept me for what I'm doing. You must approve of what I'm doing. You must validate what I'm doing. And I'm here to tell you, church, that that strategy is straight from the pit of hell, and it's unfortunately exactly what's happened. It has pushed people, again, Pentecostals, back to the middle of the road because the cultural influence has become so bold and so blatant and so prevalent that even in our culture right now, violence and hatred and sexual immorality, ridicule and contempt for God, His church, and His plans have become mainstream. Good is viewed as evil, and evil is viewed as good. The prophet Isaiah warned about this. In Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, 
He says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put their bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah was saying, you know what? There's coming a time when everything is going to be completely shifted and people are going to be involved in evil, wicked behavior and they're going to say that it's God, that it's righteous, that it's holy, that there's nothing wrong with it. And we're seeing that happen in our culture right now. God's truth has been marginalized. God's church has been labeled non-essential. God's people have been attacked by a wave of intimidation and fear because the sin and the wickedness is getting bolder and more prevalent. And many believers, as a result of this increase in wickedness, are shrinking back in their faith in intimidation and fear. We've all heard the phrase cancel culture. To stand now for righteousness, to stand for truth, it may cost you your job. It may cost you any number of things because there's this wicked, evil culture now that is threatening and, 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 and producing fear that we, we don't dare confront that. We don't dare do anything about that or this will happen or this will happen or this will happen. And so we give a long list of all of the risk that's involved with that. Many of you are seeing on the news as well. We think, okay, that's in other countries. No, that's not in other countries. Some of you are seeing, actually, individuals just shared a video with me, again, just this last week, of what's happening in Canada. The churches that are deciding to continue to have church. Now, I'm all for, again, respecting authority. But when we see some of the things that are happening in Canada where the police are coming in, they're locking doors on churches. They're putting fences around churches. And that, again, it is a direct ploy of the enemy to intimidate and create fear within the church and within the people of God. So the question that I have today is, have we lost the edge? Have we embraced comfort and culture and abandoned our call to live on the edge? Have we allowed intimidation and fear to push us to the middle of the road where everybody else is? Have we been more concerned about what our friends say and what culture says and being popular or acceptable than we are about what God says? Are we just following the crowd because it's the easiest path to take? Have we allowed our love for God to grow cold in the midst of all this wickedness and evil and intimidation? I think it takes a rocket scientist to know the answer to several of those questions. So the question is absolutely yes. In many cases, not in all. And we shouldn't be surprised. Matthew chapter 24 kind of tells about some of the things that we need to be aware of in the end times. Matthew 24, starting with verse 4, says, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pains. And here's a verse that you made me know, you kind of choose to ignore, but this is what Jesus said is going to happen in the last days. Then they, talking about the evil, they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And verse 12, and because lawlessness and wicked and evil will be increased, the love of many will go cold. The love of many that once said, I am, I am all for serving Jesus. I am absolutely committed to him. But now that the pressure's on, now that the lawlessness increases, now that the consequences of serving Jesus are a little bit greater and a little bit riskier, 
than they were in the past. I'm not quite as in love with Jesus as I was, and Matthew tells us. That's going to happen. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So we look at the early church. The church in the book of Acts faced a similar situation. The Roman Empire was an incredibly wicked empire. Sin, lawlessness, evil, blatant. Obviously, they didn't have the, the, the means that we have today through media and technology to promote that and pump that into individuals' homes and right onto their phones. But it was all part of the culture. And that early church that was wholeheartedly serving Jesus and wanted people to know about Jesus and telling other people about Jesus. They had experienced the power of the resurrection. They saw it. They saw Jesus die on a cross. They saw him alive even afterwards. And they began to tell people, and and the culture there, not everybody was real excited about them telling people about that. And so that church began to experience persecution They began to experience some incredible trials and they were brought and they were thrown in jail and some of them were were beaten. And in Acts chapter 4, that was a situation where the church, the individuals, those believers that were, were wholeheartedly following Jesus, now they were experiencing something that that they'd not experienced before. It was like, oh, I I I didn't realize it was going to be this difficult, or that there's going to be this much opposition. And so those early believers, they were, they were uh, brought to the courts, again, some of them beaten. And in Acts chapter 4, and this is the verse that I want to focus on, Acts chapter 4, verse 29, those believers were released from that, that jail, and the believers gathered together and kind of shared what had happened with other believers. And in Acts chapter 4, the church said, you know what, we need to pray. We need to pray like we've never prayed before. Now, I'm going to read the prayer in just a minute, but I want you to notice what they did not pray. The early church did not pray, God, get those people that persecuted us. They did not say, God, kill those evil, wicked people that imprisoned us, that beat us. They did not wish hell and and, 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 uh, fire and everything on on their enemies. They didn't pray for that. In verse 29, this is what they prayed. They said, now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. He said, God, we need We need boldness. We need courage and strength and fortitude to keep doing what you have called us to do, even in the midst of their threats, even in the increase of the persecution and the tribulation and the jail and the torture and the beatings and the killings. God, we need need supernatural boldness. The next chapter 4 goes on and says, after that prayer... There was a shaking in the room, and the Holy Spirit came into that room and empowered them, and they experienced boldness. It was a gift from God. They experienced power. Now, it doesn't say that that the Holy Spirit came and removed them from the situation. It doesn't say that the Holy Spirit came and wiped out all their enemies. It says that they received power power, boldness to continue to do what God had called them to do even in the midst of that culture so two things, we wrap things up, two things that I believe that God is calling us as Pentecostal believers in this Pentecostal church to step out in the area of boldness one is I believe that now is the time that we need to boldly pray that was a bold prayer that they prayed in in Acts chapter 4. God, grant us boldness, grant us courage. They could have. They could have prayed, God, get those people. 
They could have prayed, God, deliver us from this. God, save us from this. But no, they said, God, give us strength. You know, and that prayer, interestingly enough, that prayer is the one prayer that is repeatedly shared even in today's culture by those individuals that are living in countries that are being persecuted for their faith. They're not praying that God would remove them from the, the, the culture. They're not praying that God would kill the, uh, the jailers and that, that God would wipe out the government officials. They are praying for the same thing that the people in the book of Acts pray. They say, God, grant us great boldness and courage. Now, the second part of that is, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. I believe that those believers in the book of Acts, and again, the people that are living in persecution, they could not, they recognize they cannot make it apart from a divine empowerment. Let me just tell you, okay, it's one thing to have strong opinions and political convictions, but I will tell you right now that with the increase of wickedness and the increase of evil, your opinion and your political convictions will not help you. Your political convictions are not going to change anybody's mind. Your personal opinions about this or that or what's right or what's wrong, that, that's not going to change anything, and it's certainly not going to give you the level of courage and boldness and strength that you need to stand up against the enemy. Because the enemy is operating in supernatural power, and you need a supernatural power to come at him with, to be able to stand boldly in the midst of that. You need boldness. Several years ago, and I believe I shared this before, when I was youth pastor, we did an event at First Assembly in Minot called uh, Youth Explosion. Just uh, students from all across the, the Minot area, we invited them to come. We had a special speaker come, and the, the focus was on the power of the Holy Spirit. The theme for that year was all the power you need. And it was on the, the power of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we had hundreds of students that came uh, to that event that they, they experienced God just in amazing ways. Several of them got saved for the first time. Many of them were baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. But one of the things that we found is that in that event, one of the first nights, is that we were fired up and excited from all these students that had experienced this power and this personal encounter with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. But we found out that people that don't believe in the Holy Spirit or the churches that, again, are cessationists that really don't believe in all that stuff, they don't get as excited when their kids start speaking in tongues as we do. And so there came opposition, even within the church community. There were youth pastors that were calling me saying, what, what are you doing? Why did you invite our students? One, pastor, one youth pastor uh, went out to lunch with him, and he was upset because he didn't believe in that whole baptism in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues stuff. And some of his students came, and now they experienced it. And so now he's got to try to, to clean this mess up. He said, why would, you, why would you invite us to an event like that when you knew? When you knew that's what you're going to talk about. You knew that we don't believe in that. And I believe that even at that point, the Holy Spirit gave me the words to say because I really didn't have a good answer. And I looked him straight in the face and said, you know what? The poster that we promoted this, it said, the name of the event is Youth Explosion. The theme is all the power you need. Under the description of the speaker said, Dean will be speaking about the incomparable power that comes from the Holy Spirit. The event was held at an Assembly of God church. <laughs> what were you expecting? Shame on us if they didn't have an experience like that. We're not going to lower everything down just so you don't get offended. I love you. I believe in you. You do what you need to do. But we're not going to back down from that. And I will tell you that that event was probably one of the most significant turning points for me, even as a Pentecostal, because I, as a youth pastor, had to determine at that point, do I really believe in this? Do I really believe that this is necessary? Because the easiest thing in the world for me to do would be to talk to that youth pastor and say, you know what, you're right, I'm sorry, we will never do that again. We had people that were calling and making all kinds of accusations. I felt like a defense lawyer because there were times that there was one time in particular there was an accusation and we recorded the services. Some of you remember cassette tapes. Remember those ancient dinosaurs? They're about that big. You don't worry about it. We recorded those services and there was one individual that made an accusation. The speaker said this. 
we had to pull out the tape and play back for this individual. No, this is what the speaker said to prove that that was not true. But that event, again for me, was a significant turning point because I realized, you know what? And I shared this with that youth pastor again that was upset with me. So you know what? I, I, appreciate, I appreciate your concern. And I'm sorry that you feel that way. But I believe this. And this was several years ago. He said, I believe that students today will not make it spiritually in the culture in which they are living without a supernatural power. They won't. And I'm not saying that it's fatalistic. I'm saying they are needy. A divine empowerment is more necessary now than it was when I did that event as a youth pastor. You don't have the strength or the fortitude, nor do I, to stand up against some of the things that are coming and already coming. It's going to require a boldness. It's going to require us to pray boldly. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, when that empowerment comes, Romans chapter 8 says this, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For do we, we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Some of you are probably here and, and you love Jesus. And if you were to die today, you were going to heaven. There's no doubt about that. But maybe even in your prayer life, your prayer really is not praying prayers on the edge. It's praying kind of middle of the road prayers. And God honors that. God hears those. But my concern is, is that for many, we're praying, quite honestly, some pretty weak prayers. Because we're praying prayers that are coming from our own ideas. We're praying prayers that are coming from our, our, our own thoughts of what should happen. And, and again, so some of those prayers, and there's nothing wrong with them, but, but our prayers are, you know, God, God bless my family. Or, God, bless the church service today. Or, Lord, help me to have a good day at work today. Okay, you know, all those are good, but I would not really call those real edgy type prayers. I believe that one of the things that is necessary now more than ever is for people that are filled with the Holy Spirit to pray prayers that are on the edge, praying for individuals that have been addicted for years and saying, God, deliver them as only you can do it. God, free them from the years of bondage that they've been in. God, change their life as only you can change their life. Do what nobody else can do so that you would be honored and that you would be glorified. God, that we would see manifestations again in the second part of that prayer, even in Acts, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. God, heal that individual. Help them walk again. Make them see again. Signs and wonders that people are awake and they say, that was supernatural. And those are the prayers that we need to pray. Let me specifically address the, the men in the, in the congregation and the watching online and heads of households. We need to be praying absolutely, God bless my family, God protect my family. But you know what? The day and age in which we're living, I believe it's going to take bolder prayers than that. Because there is an enemy that is out to steal and kill and destroy you, your marriage, your kids, your grandkids. And if all we do is just say, God bless my kids, it is time for us to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and confront the enemy and let him know, you will not have my children. You will not have my grandchildren. They will not serve you. They will not be caught up in this wave of wickedness and, and evil. They will not get stuck in these addictions. They will not because God, by his Holy Spirit, is going to prevent that from happening. We need to pray bold prayers for our kids. We need to pray bold prayers for our marriages. We need to pray bold prayers for our community. Not just God bless. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. Mark Batterson wrote a book on prayer called The Circle Maker. He said, bold prayers honor God, and God honors bold prayers. God isn't offended by your biggest dream or your boldest prayers. He is offended by anything less. There's a statement that caught my attention. He said, if your prayers aren't impossible to you, they're insulting to God. Say that again. If your prayers aren't impossible to you, they're insulting to God. Think about that. God has given us the resources. He said, anything that you ask, anything that you ask, I'll grant you. 
I've given you power by the Holy Spirit to pray for, for supernatural things, for people to be healed, set free, all the things that I've already talked about. We can ask God for any of those things. We've got the power of the Holy Spirit to do any of those things. And what do we pray for? God, please help the sun come out today because I have a garage sale. Now, does God do that yet? Do you understand what I'm saying? Is God is looking and saying, that's all you're going to pray for? When, when you've got, I've given you all the resources to pray for all these other things, and you're just, just going to pray for a good day? It's time that we prayed bold prayers. So let me ask a question. What are you praying for right now? Who are you praying for right now? And how bold are your prayers? Are you praying for something right now that the only way that it can be answered is if God intervenes? Those are the prayers that God is asking. Those are the prayers that God is honoring. The Bible says you don't have because you don't ask. You're not seeing these things because you're not praying boldly. You're not praying for that, that marriage to be restored, for that child to be set free. You're not praying those things. That's why it's not happening. God grant us the faith to pray bold prayers. Second thing that I believe that God wants us to do is boldly stand. Boldly stand. Now this seems almost contradictory to what I've already talked about because standing is not a real aggressive posture. Seems like we need to boldly, boldly attack or, or boldly confront, and all those things are part of it too. But I want to make sure that you understand that boldness is not synonymous with being obnoxious. You can be bold in your faith and not stand up on a table in your workplace and tell everybody that they're going to hell if they don't turn their lives to Jesus. Now, if God tells you to do that, I would certainly do that. But we've equated boldness with, with craziness and, and obnoxiousness. And we talked about this before, is absolutely we have a responsibility to speak the truth in love. But in Ephesians chapter 6, talking about the whole thing of the, the spiritual armor, Ephesians 6, 11, says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to Stand. Stand against the schemes of the devil. Ephesians 6, 13, 14. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. Now, it's not saying anything about attacking. It's not saying anything about confronting. Again, that's a whole other message there. But I believe that part of the problem that we've got right now in, in the culture in which we live, it's because we've got individuals and followers of Jesus Christ that the first sign of opposition, the first sign of, of confrontation, they don't stand, they actually take a step backwards. And when we take a step backwards, what happens? The enemy gains more ground. And then he sees, well, that was pretty easy, let's do it again. And so he confronts, and some wickedness or some else challenge comes up, and so we take another step back, and we take another step back, and we take another step back, and pretty soon we wonder, boy, why is the enemy messing with my family? It's because we've never stood for our family. It's every time he's confronted us in a family situation, we've taken a step backward and let him do what he wants to do for fear and intimidation. And I believe the day is now that you need a power from the Holy Spirit that you stand and say, you will not go any further than this. You will not have any more authority than this in my life, in my marriage, in my family, in my job, in my community. I'm going to stand. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. It's a great phrase, men. Let me read it again. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. That's what the Bible says. Act like men. Be strong. Did you know that society is trying to completely remove the authority of, of, of manhood right now, too? Make a joke of them. They're good for nothing. All they do is drink beer and watch porn. That's the image that, that the enemy is communicating. You can never rely on them. You never trust them. That's not God's plan. That's why I'm so excited about the guys that are participating in our authentic manhood groups. They're recognizing this and they're stepping up and saying, you know what? No, this is, this is something real here. And they're taking that responsibility. They're accepting that authority. 
and starting to move in that direction. They are doing what this verse says. We need to boldly pray. We need to boldly stand. And there's several other things as well. But we need to pray, I believe. The same prayer as the church in the book of Acts. We come before God and say, Now, God, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Revelation 12, 11, talking about the believers, says they overcame. One version says they conquered him, the enemy, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. Even if you kill me, I'm still not backing down. That boldness, that comes from the Holy Spirit. You can't do that on your own. If you bow your heads with me this morning, worship team, you want to come if you could, please. So now, Lord God, I preached what I believe that you want me to preach. Now, Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. Lord, I come against intimidation. I come against fear. I pray that it be broken because you do not give us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Kathy, whenever you're ready, you want to just play the chorus of that? So let's, this is what I want us to do. We're just going to worship just for the next few moments. The chorus is worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. This is what's going to happen around the throne room in the end times. And as we worship, I believe that God by His Holy Spirit is just going to grant us a, a renewed boldness, a renewed strength. Let's sing this together. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. From you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. I encourage you to worship boldly. Let's sing it again. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you. the glory you are worthy of it all you are worthy of it all for from you are all things and to you are all things you deserve the glory let's sing it boldly right to him again you are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. 
right to Him. And with all boldness, allow the Spirit to empower you. You're worthy of it all. I speak and you say, you know what? The enemy has been intimidating me. The enemy has been creating fear in me to pray boldly, to stand firmly, and I need divine power today. I need divine boldness today. So I'm going to ask that you just take a bold step and just come out from where you're seated and just stand all along the right front here. We're going to just pray. We're going to continue to worship, and we're going to pray that God fills you with His Holy Spirit and fills you with boldness to pray boldly, to stand boldly, to stand firm, and to live on the edge. To live on the edge, to do things that you wouldn't do on your own, to say things you wouldn't say on your own, to go places you wouldn't go on your own, to see things that you would never see on your own. We're going to continue to sing this, but if that's you, you know what say, I, I need that boldness. I want that boldness. Just begin and just make your way to the front and just tell God, and we're just going to sing this again. You are worthy of it all. Pastor Von Dell and I are just going to pray. We're just going to pray a quick prayer. God grant boldness. God grant boldness. God grant boldness. Some of our board members, if you want to come, you can be prayed for, but I want us to be praying for everybody that's up here. Those of you that are seated, just continue to worship and say, God, we need boldness. God, forgive us for living in the middle of the road. Forgive us for being the lukewarm. God, you're calling us to live on the edge, and we embrace that today. We embrace that. Though. We embrace that there's risk involved. Lord, we desperately need that. Lord, our culture desperately needs it. We desperately need it, Lord God. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Let's sing that chorus again. You're worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. We're just going to come. We're just going to pray for each one of you. Pastor Vondell, again, just praying real quick. Lucas, if you just lead us, you are worthy of it all. From you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you. Of it all for 
Now all over this place, can we do this? I'm going to ask you to take another bold step. I want you to begin to just express your worship to the Lord right now. Just lift your voices. Some of you, as you begin to pray, as you begin to worship, you're going to notice that you don't, you don't recognize the language that you're speaking. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit praying through you. Others of you, you may just be speaking in English. That's fine. But let's just lift this place. Lift your voices right now. The Holy Spirit's not going to make you talk. Okay? You need to use your voice. So lift your voice right now. All over this place. Let's lift our voice. Those of you that are watching online, same thing. Let's lift our voice. Don't be timid. Don't worry about what anybody to the left or the right is going to think about you. There is one audience that we are focused on right now, and that is God. So lift your voice right now. Begin to pray. Those of you that have been baptized in the Spirit, I encourage you to just use your prayer language right now. Just begin to pray in the Spirit. Again, those of you maybe have not done that before, that may start to happen when you begin to speak. If it doesn't, that's fine. Just keep praying in English. Just continue to worship and just declare the goodness of God. Thank you, God. A, a powerful weapon of the enemy is intimidation and fear. The Bible says that the, the, the devil wanders around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You know why he roars? Because that's all he can do. He doesn't actually have any more authority than what you give him. But if he can roar and keep you scared and intimidated, he wins. Some of you, I believe, that you have allowed that intimidation to fear to grab a hold of you. Some of you, you're fearful for your kids, you're fearful for your marriage, you're fearful for your health. And I'm, we need to be conscious and aware that I get that. But there are times that I've prayed, even just in different situations myself, and I have to kind of remind myself that God has not given me a spirit of fear but he has broken it. He's broken it. And some of you may need to actually take your hands out. I've done that many times when I pray to God. I come against right now that spirit, and I pray it's broken. It's broken. It's done. It's gone. If you're here today and say, you know what, that's me. Maybe you need to do that. And you know what, don't do this, okay? Don't do a... Boldly, boldly let the enemy know. That's broken. As of right now, God, I pray in the name of Jesus. God, those that have been attacked, and Lord, that the enemy has, where there's a spirit of intimidation and fear there, the authority that you've given me right now, the authority that you've given us by the power of the Holy Spirit, we come against that intimidation, we come against that fear, and we declare right now in the name of Jesus that it's gone. It is broken right now, God, in Jesus' name. They are free from that right now in Jesus' name. Lord, they are set free from that worry. They are set free from that concern. Lord, they're set free from that fear. God, in Jesus' name, that we would start acting like free people that you have given us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. The Spirit of the Lord is there's freedom. There's freedom. There's freedom. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. You are worthy of it all.
your voice. Don't wait for somebody else. Lift your voice. Some of you maybe need to clap your hands. Go ahead and clap your hands. Lift your voice. Begin to pray boldly. Begin to declare boldly the goodness of God. I believe there's still some here that, that God wants to, God wants to break some things for you. But He's asking you to step out in boldness. He's, he's giving you all the Spirit. And some of you even started as like, eh, maybe not. But, and again, that may be praying. Maybe that's that's a language you don't understand. Say, I don't know if that's really me. It's not you. Okay? It's the Holy Spirit that's working through you. Step out in boldness. And just do that right now. your voices. Thank you, Lord. Let's just look up here just for a moment. We're going we're to continue. For those of you that want to stay, we're going to leave the altars available. I want to make sure that you understand, okay, that boldness is not the same as being obnoxious. And sometimes in, in Pentecostal circus, we, we try to manipulate people to yell and scream and shout like that's an indication of boldness. Sometimes it is, but that's, that's not the only indication of boldness. Okay? But I do believe that, that God is calling you to take a step of boldness like you've never taken before. And what that looks like, I don't know. For some of you taking that step of boldness, lifting your hands, that's a step of boldness. I have never done this before. For some of you, it's praying out loud. You've never done that before. Some of you would be shouting. I remember when I was a youth pastor, there was a young man in, in our, our youth ministry, Brian Lee. Remember Brian? Brian Lee was one of the boldest individuals that I ever met. And uh, in our youth service, we would we'd have altar time, and I'd be praying for kids. And all of a sudden, Brian, just in the back of the room, was just at the top of his lungs. Thank you, Jesus! I love you, Lord! And like every kid, I mean, he just did it so, it just took people by surprise. But then kids stopped and was like, oh, it's just Brian. And then they, then they just kept praying. Now, every kid didn't do that, but Brian did. And that's not the indication of boldness, is how loud you yell. It's this inner strength of praying boldly. And some of you praying in the spirit. Again, you don't have to yell. You know what? The enemy's not, Satan's not deaf. When you pray in boldness, under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't have to be loud to be effective. But there may be times that as you begin to pray, you'll notice the volume starts getting louder because God is stirring your heart with that deeper conviction. So we're going to continue to worship. You stay here as long as you want to. Those of you that feel that you're, you're done, just dismissed. Lord God, we thank you. Thank you for your spirit. And Lord, as we leave this place today, Lord, even those that remain, God, that you would manifest your Holy Spirit in us and through us. Lord, that there be miraculous things that cannot be explained by any other way than it was God. It was God that did it. And Lord, as we leave this place today, Lord, we're facing uncertain situations this week. But some are already facing challenges in their workplace, in their families. Lord, pressure from even ungodly, immoral people. 
Lord God, may we boldly pray and may we boldly stand under the power of your Holy Spirit this week. And we recognize, Lord God, that this is a daily thing that we need to come to you and say, God, grant me boldness for today. And Tuesday, we need to pray that you would grant us boldness for the day. And Wednesday, we need to pray that you would grant us boldness for the day. And Lord, thank you for that. So Lord, I just speak blessing right now on each individual here watching online. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Let's sing this chorus a couple more times again. You stay as long as you want to. If you got something specifically that you'd like prayer for, be available here. Pastor Von Dell, Mandy, you're here. Stay as long as you want to. This will be just a place of prayer. If you want to go and visit, just encourage you to do that out in the, in the foyer.
then sings my soul, my Savior. 